You're listening to a This Day original podcast. To he as journalist need to speak out and show mirror to the government, right? Whoever is in the path. Things changed really abruptly, almost overnight. After that, it was down and down and down. And I don't know who called, who brought pressure on whom. Apart from the the fact that my owner directly told me personally they are under pressure, the kind of pressure they cannot handle. Three months down the line, I was out of the job. The present generation of owners are not fired by the same degree of little ideals that the earlier owners had. So uh, now a present day owner is thinking of where his next hundred tolls uh, is going to come from. He is not bothered about whether his application is actually holding the government to account or you no. Know, those ideals have changed. Uh, like so, yeah, I, I think I would uh, ascribe it to a generational shift. To an extent, I, I do agree that editors of this country have been failing the profession. My name is Mohit Satyanand and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Reader's Room. The idea being to invite readers into this uh, little chamber of ours where we discuss one book with its author. And the idea really and the hope is that this discussion is a teaser into the book and rather than replacing the book, invites readers into this book. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the show Ruben Banerjee to discuss his book Editor Missing and More. The name clearly suggests that there's a lot else happening inside there. And through the many uh, chapters of the book, Ruben discusses many aspects of his life in journalism. It may be a little ambitious to cover the entire scope of the book. So I'm going to focus on what the book title suggests. Missing has a double meaning in this particular context. In a sense, the missing role of the editor and how the role of the editor has changed in the car media scenario. And then it refers to a very specific incident and a very powerful incident in Ruben's professional life as an editor. But we'll keep that dangling for a moment and um, start with what you've said very often in your book, which is that um, in your three years as Outlook Editor-in-Chief, you thought it was a dream job. You had no interference from the, uh, from the owners, from the chief executive, and you were working in an organization that you'd always admired and aspired to be part of. And you were very conscious of the fact that you were occupying a role which was once occupied by the very iconic Vinod Mehta. And then suddenly, things changed, where suddenly you felt that you lacked the space to do what you wanted to, and the relationship with the chief executive and with the owners changed. What came about? You tell us something. Uh, well, uh, uh, that's a very long story, and uh, um, but then it's necessary to read in, uh, and I'll try and be as uh, precise as possible. Uh, as, I, as you rightly said, yes, uh, the first, uh, I was the group editor-in-chief of Outlook for three years, three months, uh, to be precise. The first three years were fantastic. I had no issues. I would go around the city saying that I am the most free and independent editor in India possibly can have. Zero interference. Then things changed. Things changed really abruptly, almost overnight. And it's primarily because of the reason like we ran a cover and that was during the height, uh, the second wave of the COVID pandemic uh, when Delhi and other places were very badly dead. People were dropping dead, no oxygen, no ventilators, no hospital beds. So we decided to do a cover and uh, and we decided to take a look because we were we almost felt orphaned at that point of time. And I and my ed other editors, we uh, uh, we came, uh, we concluded that staying quiet at that same at that point of time would amount to complicity in mass deaths. We as journalists need to speak out and show mirror to the government, right? Whoever is in the path. So we decided to run the cover. And uh, to be very honest, as I describe in the book, uh, the very controversial cover that we finally came up with, missing, where we said that the government of India is missing. We made it look like a, a missing police poster. Uh, when we started out, when we were ideating, even the word missing was not even in our mind. Like it, It's something that we uh, thought about as we went along. And when we were ideating about the cover cover, the cover was being designed. Uh, we 
I thought uh, we did a very good job with that particular issue. It was a hard hitting, very straight. Uh, we had some galaxy of writers, both from the right and the left. Pratap Bhanu Mehta on this side, Manoj Cha. Uh, on the from the other side, we had from BJP. Uh, also, we had a BJP voice because I have always believed in both sides journalism, uh, and I have always believed in the fact that give both sides, uh, and then you take an editorial stand. As long as you keep the readers readers involved, uh, informed wow. of all sides, and then you tell the reader that when this is what people are saying, but this is what I as an editor believe. I think I have not cheated the reader. I have kept him uh, in the loop, kept him better informed. And that's precisely what we tried to do. We had even a BJP senior functionary writing in that issue. But yes, overall, the tone and tenor of that issue was very critical of the government because that was our lived experience. No oxygen, no hospital beds. People were dying in parking lots and one kind of things were happening. It was a horror time, simply. And this issue, uh, it became super, super viral. Uh, like within an Within a few hours, people were changing their WhatsApp images into this cover. So this cover became the biggest thing. Like the national, international media took note of it. Politicians were tweeting. Uh, while we were being appreciated, yes, bouquets were coming our way. But then there were br bricks as well. Because those aligned with the government thought that we are uh, stooges of the opposition, this and that. What was the initial reaction of the proprietors when the issue came up. So what happened was, so normally the practice was, it was a Thursday. Thursdays were when uh, the magazine would get printed. And when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I would do is I tweet my latest uh, cover to tell the world that when this is our latest issue. And that is what I did. It was quite till uh, like one union minister who I personally knew reached out to me saying that uh, what is this, this and that. But there was no pressure. He was just trying to figure out like whether we actually had done this cover or not. I think the fireworks started uh, from the evening when the owners, it reached the owners. I don't know who called the owners or whatever happened. Then my CEO kept calling me up repeatedly saying that he is in the line of fire. Owners from Bombay are calling him up and giving him a dressing down. So he was panicking. And then finally uh, the dreaded call from Bombay came. And as I described in the book, they told me in that many words that uh, they are under the kind of pressure, the pressure that they cannot handle, quote unquote. So I presume that things have gone out of control and uh, we must have done our job too well. So I was told that uh, now I must lie low. So I said, okay, so I, I don't believe, I never believed in compromises, uh, but I believed in adjustments. Like I can adjust a few small things without compromising on my basic. So I said, okay, I've done my job. Uh, the issue is out. Uh, I can cook for it. Uh, no problem. I, I I was willing to make that small little adjustment and give my owners a little uh, leeway to whatever they were trying to do. They, I, be, I believe they were trying to douse the fires. Okay. Uh, then that night, and then that's a long story, so it never really. So after that, it was downhill, downhill, downhill. I don't know who called, who brought pressure on whom, apart from the, the fact that my owner directly told me personally they are under pressure, the kind of pressure they cannot handle. Three months down the line, I was out of the job. So, I want to pick up two things from here. Firstly, there was another issue which you talk about in your book, which was the issue on, on terror laws. And uh, that seemed to only increase the pressure. In retrospect, do you think having been told to lie low, proposing the issue on terror laws was a good idea? But then what am I supposed to do if I am an editor? Like, what do you do? I'm ne I have never compromised on my whatever the principles that I stand for. See, they told me to lie low in context of that missing cover, not to go to town, not to publicize it any further. I said, it's fine because I've done my job. The story, the issue has gone viral. Uh, people have come to know of it. So I can lie low. So I kept low. In fact, I did not Though the next day, uh, that's again another story that the missing cover, the controversial cover was missing from online. When the magazine went online the next day, it became another controversial story. Other websites reported about it, that how is it that Outlook's missing cover is missing from online? Politicians uh, <laughs> tweeted about it. I did not join issue because I had this, uh, my owner's request. I was kind of respecting my owner's request that please lie low and I lay low. Uh, it's not that that uh, journalists had not called me up. I could have given them a quotable quote and 
kind of added fuel to the fire. I just kept quiet. I said, no, I will not. So I did not. And then two and a half months down the line, Stan Swami died, if you recall it. And uh, so that was a great news hook. And uh, see, I was doing my following my journalistic principles. Like, if you go through that story, that cover, we put uh, terror laws. It wasn't only about that Stan Swami, BJP. No, we looked at uh, the misuse of terror laws across the states under various uh, political dispensations from Mamta Banerjee's Trinamool Congress to Navin Patnaik's BJD to uh, Jagan Mohan Reddy's Andhra Pradesh. We looked at terror laws and the ab and its abuses. So the story was very, very fair. And it wasn't any, in fact, it helps BJP. Like BJP can turn around and say, uh, well, <laughs> we are not the only ones. In fact, some of the most draconian laws as in my edit, that particular editorial I mentioned, it was Mr. possibly Mr. Chidambaram who helped to uh, draw up those laws. So, and I said that. And then uh, that particular issue, we, we had to uh, cover Pegasus also because Pegasus was a big, big story. And how was it? If we are a news magazine, we are in that genre, how can you ignore Pegasus, which is a global story, right? Or stands from his death. So... I did, and I still believe that we did a very fair job without being partial. We did not take any sides. We represented all uh, shades of opinion. And then I was told that you can't do Pegasus, you can't do terror laws. These are stories you can't do. I said, then what are we supposed to do? I see that very clearly. You mentioned in your book that it's not as though the owners had not come under pressure earlier. For example, during the Vajpayee regime, they had been subjected to raids. So they knew... What are the pressures and uh, the pain points of being owners of a news magazine? But they managed to resist it at that point in time. This time they didn't. What do you think changed? I think the appetite for taking on pressure has hugely decreased, uh, declined among Indian uh, media owners. And one reason could be that laws of the land have changed and they have become stricter. Like earlier, say, suppose, say, uh, when the Rahijas were initially raided during that Vajpayee's uh, tenure, uh, there were income tax raids and all. Uh, there would be cases filed against uh, them, right, any owner. And then the owners, it's up to the owners to fight out those cases. The uh, law of the land will take its course, the judiciary will take its own die, and maybe after 10, 15 years, they would be given a clean check. Now, the money, uh, the laws are such that you... The PMA, the PMA. The PMA, it's... Uh, kind of, uh, what do they say here? Uh, they seize it, right? So they can suck out your entire capital. Like they can come up with, say, 20,000 crore or whatever fictitious charge. And then that money is locked up. So your business is dead. And you are in uh, behind bars without any bail. So I think the laws have become stricter. And so I, see, I think uh, the owners show less and less appetite. And also there has been a generational change uh, among the owners. The present generation of owners are not fired by the same degree of little ideals that the earlier owners had. Uh, so uh, now a present day owner is thinking of where his next hundred tones uh, is going to come from. He is not bothered about whether his publication is actually holding the government to account or no, those ideals have changed. Like so, yeah, I, I think I would uh, ascribe it to a generational shift. So it's a whole uh, kind of other reasons as well. Like you are more dependent on government ads, even your uh, uh, the events that you they're sponsored by the government, uh, right? Now, one of the counterpoints that you yourself bring up in your book and you uh, quote a conversation that you've had uh, is Indian Express. Uh, which seems to be able to withstand pressure a little bit more, and certainly Anand Goenka claims that he is able to, and uh, pours himself up as an exemplar of what can be done. Firstly, do you think that's true? To what extent? And secondly, why do you think that they're able to do that, whereas a lot of other newspapers are not able to? See, among the media, the other newspapers that I read, I've given up on mainstream media almost. Like, they don't inspire me anymore because I know I have friends and colleagues who work with other newspapers. I know the kind of compromises that they're doing. Some of them are very, very obvious. Some of them do it very subtly. Okay. Uh, among all the newspapers that I read, the Indian Express still inspires confidence in me because some of their journalism is fantastic. 
some of their editorial, the kind of stand they take. I wish my owners also had the same kind of spine. Uh, see, because I keep saying this, this is my realization. We can do journalism as long as our owners have the appetite for that kind of journalism. Like if the owners don't have the appetite, I only wish I had an Indian Express uh, kind of owner. I could have carried on. See, I for with regard to this book, when I was writing this book, I had a very long chat with uh, Anand Goenka. And he himself was saying something very interesting. He said that, yeah, they also come under pressure. That phone call comes, uh, you know, the, the whatever that's supposed to follow, it happens. But they have kind of figured out a way, the Indian Express has figured out a way how to resist pressure. So they have kind of mastered it. So, and he interestingly says that despite all this, the ministers come for their express ideas exchange to express uh, events. So it's a great, uh, I, I wish other owners get inspired by the Indian Express management. For that to happen, we need to understand what is that magic sauce, what is it that gives uh, Indian Express that ability to stand up for itself. Because it's so, the brand value is so much, it's so, it carries so much of credibility. I think government also res resists, does not want to take a pick up a fight or go beyond the point. So I'm sure they must be, the government must be exploring ways and means to show their displeasure from time to time. But at the same time, they kind of, and Express has to this down. And also, uh, I know that Express comes in for a lot of criticism from particularly one section of the media. Because they give platform to uh, people in the government, people with the BJP. I think that's the way journalism should be. Why will you not give them platform? Why not? Absolutely, give them. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you think it also has to do with the fact that Indian Express, uh, the owners of Indian Express don't have any other substantial business interests outside of journalism? Exactly, they're less vulnerable. <laughs> right, they, it's only their media business. Whereas uh, the other owners have so many other interests, so they are vulnerable. As I have mentioned in my book, the show, uh, the Hindustan Times management, they are into almost everything, right? So there are barring a few exceptions, like my Outlook owners, they are owners of Excite Battery, they are into real estate. Uh, so uh, my sympathies lie with them, but I wish they showed a uh, spine. When reading your book, uh, Ruben, I realized that you and I were at the same session at uh, Jaipur Literature Festival, or now, almost four years ago, it seems like a very long time, where Rana Ayub said, there's no good journalist in India with a job. How true do you think that is? Well, of course not. Uh, just because I have lost my job doesn't mean that there are no good journalists uh, in the country. No, of course not. There are fantastic journalists. Yeah, to an extent, I, I do agree that editors of this country have been failing the profession. Yeah, generally, there have been. There are still from very inspiring editor. But generally speaking, if I have to generalize, uh, the failing is largely mostly on the part of the editors and the owners. At the same time we've seen, and again it's something which you cover in your book, that somebody who was a friend and then a boss of yours, Bobby Bush, who was uh, editor-in-chief at uh, Hindustan Times, uh, lost his job in what seemed to be a very direct reaction to certain editorial stances that he had seen. A friend of mine, Parajoy Guataputta, lost his job as head of uh, EPW. So there have been editors, it seems so editors who take a stance, do make themselves very vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, editors are very vulnerable, but generally that has also, see, editors will lose jobs, given the current situation. Like if you have to do your job seriously, ethically, you will lose jobs. More out of frustration, I tell my friends within my close circuit, I have never made it earlier. Like editors, if you have to continue to succeed as an editor now, you have to be a glorified stenographer. The situation has come to that. Like you can't take your own stand. Uh, whatever you have dictated, uh, you put it. So that's a instead of effort. So would I be correct then in saying that even though you don't agree with Ranayub's statement about uh, no good journalist with a job, there's no good editor with a job? No, no, I wouldn't say that. There are still editors. Like my, the Indian Express, Ash Kamal Jha, he, inspire, uh, he inspires me. Uh, I have always been a great fan of Mr. Enram. I can name so many of them. Like, uh, I may not necessarily always agree with them. Or Shekhar Gupta. Or uh, there are so many others I can name. Yeah, it's an endangered profession, yes. But it doesn't mean that just because Ruben Banerjee has lost his job, uh, journalism has come to an end. No, there are journalists, reporters... Uh, I can name so many of them. These fantastic journalism is happening. 
there is good journalism which happened yes but at the same time yes overall the situation is terrible editors are failing and owners are capitulated yes that's a general trend yes so we see a new trend um one excellent journalist again you know you all may i may not agree um is uh, ravish kumar uh entity of entity we have now been bought out by media house whose proximity to the political party in power has never been uh, disguised and rather than waiting for all the things to happen ravish has taken uh, a decision and marched out uh, what do you think is the future for independent journalists like ravish kumar or for that matter the wire scroll news laundry etc i think that is what i have elaborated to my book because i have given up on mainstream media mainstream media by and large is badly compromised i think journalism independent journalism will now will have to be essentially shouldered by independent journalists and independent or and websites more that you no free uh, websites people uh, websites which do not have other business interests so uh, ravish kumar possibly he won't have the kind of resources or the reach that ntv platform gave him but you cannot still wish away ravish kumar he still has a constituency he still will have a voice why i do not necessarily agree with why because i don't agree with their reporting style uh, kind of uh, stance it takes but i am a huge fan of why still scroll yes so they are the news laundry news minute i love them all this issue of partiality and balance um you it's very clear where you stand that you would like a news organization to have past to have impartiality and balance within itself so if our group had uh, articles criticizing the government's inaction on now uh, covid and you also had bjp making their stops but but the question i have for you is that when um a large number of organizations and those which are the most heavily backed most heavily uh, funded and made it very clear that they are going to be completely partial in by way of being pro the regime and party isn't there a need for organizations quite clearly represent the other side don't we need that well uh, my only point would be like in that case like for food packets you say this packet contains this much of calcium this much of vitamin even media products should say okay i stand for 99% congress and then let's say it's the bjp say that <laughs> okay i would expect that then it's fine if you have made it a or you have told me in inform me up front that this is what i stand for and this is what i will give you it's fine but you can't say i am an independent media and you're supposing i were to say supposing i were to say on my masthead that my job as a journalistic outlet is to hold the government account okay so does it does it also imply that the government never does any good work and ne- the government will never get any positive play if it's it suppose if say suppose it does something good what happens so i think this is true about news right uh good news is never news no no i it's always, always i uh, love good news i am all for development news i love it because i find it very inspiring no that may be so ruben but let me ask you a question i you know i'm not expecting an uh, exact answer but um, of all the covers of uh, outlook in a particular year how many of them would represent good news and how many of them would represent this is one of the biggest successful covers that we did was she the dalit when we talked about dalit women it was one of the best selling covers that we had in the last 3 years missing yes missing was it went viral okay that's for different reason and i'm certain that maybe uh, that issue was not even properly marketed because tried was to kind of put the lid okay and that was the fire but she the danit it was so i think there is uh, why wouldn't i a story is a story like if it inspires me fine if it outrages me it's okay that's fine there is a need to be outraged from time to time so that we keep our bearings uh it's on fine but see i i don't mind like if why is to tell me okay i am this is what my motto is this is what my principle is i'm fine with it because they have but then i see that i am independent i am neither well 
the moment you say you are independent so which means you are independent truly independent right but then you are carrying a baggage then that you shouldn't any anyway. okay i let's not debate the point because i think independence uh it doesn't mean independence of opinion independence can be of two kinds uh one is uh, independence of uh, in monetary terms uh of uh, support from a particular ideology or a particular party and the other is what you're talking about is a certain ideological bent and uh what you're saying is that if you have a particular ideological bent or a particular partisan bent then you should declare it i think that i i i, I would declare it if i if i on the internet i'd say up front this is what i this Fair is what we'd get from Fair point. so i want to shift to something else uh, ruben which is i'm not even sure whether one can call it news but one can certainly call it media and i want to talk specifically about social media um in the context of what you talk about in your book and you brought it up in the context of um, Priyanka Gandhi and uh, the India World News Service saying that she had asked for extension on the Lodi Road on the road that, um, that she was occupying it turned out that she never made that request and so yeah and this was clearly uh, misrepresenting the issue i would not want to dwell on that particular point there but what we see um across issues and almost relentlessly is this orchestration of news which is not coming through conventional news outlet it's coming through social media and particularly through uh, whatsapp what do you think this does to the role of uh, responsible reporting in the media i think it gives us a lot of a lot of opportunity to conventional journalists mainstream media because social media is very powerful it is a fantastic it's a huge huge reach but what it lacks is editorial rigor because all these kind of misinformation non news they all go out because there is no one is checking so look at it this way yes we are under a threat from social media but because the its lack of credibility or lack of editorial rigor also throws up an opportunity for us like if we are to do a journalism properly because we will have editorial checks and balances we will have credibility we will have trust that is something which social media cannot take away from us so i see an opportunity for us provided we do a journalism well but we are not doing that's because we have kind of surrendered capitulated we are so you know seem it would seem as though credibility is unimportant uh you can it's just an it's just an constant assault of um, of mobilization uh and once that mobilization is over you move on to the next story and people have forgotten just the act of mentioning it seems to be enough to mobilize large numbers of people but that sadly the case but then you still we still have to do what we are supposed to do right we cannot uh, join the whatever the madness that's happening like we'll have to still hold our ground and talk sense right we have to hold on to our civility our principles so just because people have gone mad doesn't mean that i'll go and become mad as well like so there has to be there has to be a resistance an opposition a meaningful opposition not an exaggerated opposition but we really uh, we should hold our ground like i, I think in this context uh the fact checkers like uh, mohammad you made they're doing a fantastic job and uh, why they are being drowned they are being drowned out possibly by now but the job that they're doing is fantastic and we must applaud them for that and hopefully uh over a period of time their voices will get my multiplied uh, because their voices will be heard because finally at the end of the day people will be also tired of this mass mobilization and this crazy stuff that's happening Do you, do you see any signs of that? Uh, <laughs> Not right now, but hopefully because that is how life is. The one day is right. So things uh, they don't stay as bad as uh, one day is right. Like things have to improve, change. But uh, I can only. But that that doesn't mean that we capitulate and give up and throw up our arms in surrender. We have to keep doing what we are doing. And I think the whatever that's happening in the social media, it gives us an opportunity. but then sadly we are not doing it so what do you think is going to do it you already mentioned uh, uh, people like ortiz but you know even though i am a great supporter of fact checking sites whether it's uh, room or ortiz or whatever uh 
in a sense, they are not leading the narrative. You know, they are reactionary. And uh, the power always goes to those who lead the narrative. So how do you think this balance of power, do you see any signs of it changing? And what would you like to... See, if you ask me on... If you ask me honestly, I'm not very optimistic at this moment. Because we seem to be losing the battle. Okay. And we are in a minority. We are in a hopeless minority. But do we give up the fight? No. Seen is bleak, but we still have to do it the way we want to do it, hope, hoping that someday we will win or we will overcome this. Uh, because the, the, everything is stacked against us. The media, the ownership, the way it's structured, everything is stacked against us. Is there a single bullet which can solve everything? No, I don't have a bullet. I don't have an answer. It's a very complex issue. Uh, requires uh, a complex solution, I guess. But the minimum basic requirement is that we must fight for the basic ethics of journalism, the media, for the, for which it exists. That, that should be the starting point. I can only hope and pray that we all rediscover and uh, find our moorings again. The value, the essential value, which we promised to ourselves when we set up this nation was Satyamay of that the truth will trial. Um, I always thought that this was an unassailable uh, value. It's constantly under attack. Uh, it seems to be losing at this point in time, but um, uh, I can only join you in that hope, Ruben, that it does triumph and that responsible, balanced journalism uh, wins and that people like you who feel that the middle has disappeared to have right wing on one side and liberal on the other that a responsible middle can survive thanks very much for being on this show with us uh, Ruben all the very best and hope to meet you in person thank you thank you so very kind of you for more such podcasts articles trivia and interesting bits of information from the world of history heritage arts and culture make sure to visit thisday.app you can also check out the This Day app on Google Play Store and iOS App Store.